America and the Courts at 7 p.m. Eastern. Now, a hearing on proposals to restructure the U.S. Postal Service. Treasury Secretary John Snow and Postmaster General John Potter testified before a joint hearing of the Senate Governmental Affairs and House Government Reform Committees. This is a little over two hours. The committee will come to order. I want to begin by welcoming the members of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee to our hearing room and especially thank Chairman Collins and Senator Carper for their tireless work on this important issue. This joint hearing caps off a series of six hearings conducted by the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee and three hearings conducted by this committee's special po panel on postal reform and oversight since the report of the President's Commission on the United States Postal Service was released last July. I think that one thing we've learned from all of these hearings and from the work of the President's Commission is that the current legal framework under which the post office uh, operates is outdated and unsuited for today's economy. It's putting the jobs of millions of Americans at risk. Let me explain. Under current law, the only response available to the Postal Service uh, that they have to declining volumes and revenues is to raise rates even further. As rates go up, even more volume leaves the system, contributing to what Controller General David Walker has called a death spiral. First-class mail volumes have been in decline for several years, even as the number of addresses that the Postal Service serves increases. I believe that without comprehensive postal reform this year, we face a time in the near future when the Postal Service will no longer be able to sustain itself with higher and higher rate increases. And many of the 9 million Americans whose jobs rely on a stable, healthy postal system will be out of work. But postal reform is not only a jobs issue, it's a consumer issue. Everyone gets mail and everyone buys stamps. If we allow the Postal Service to continue its death spiral, it will hit every American in the pocketbook. Last year, this committee and the Senate Government Affairs Committee worked together, along with the administration, to solve a potential overfunding of the civil service retirement system by postal taxpayers, ratepayers. That reform delayed the next rate increase until 2006, providing much needed relief for the Postal Service's customers. But it left several unresolved issues which we must deal with as the legislation moves forward. First, the legislation transferred responsibility for funding the military portion of retiree benefits to the Postal Service for, for CSRS. I realize there are differences of opinion on whether that change should be revisited or left in place, and I look forward to the witnesses' perspectives on that. Second, the legislation required the Postal Service to calculate, collect, and place into escrow the post-2005 savings caused by the legislation. We wanted to get a clear sense of the Postal Service's plans for cost reduction and productivity enhancing capital improvements before releasing all of the savings. I believe that the Postal Service has fulfilled its requirements in this regard, and I think it's now time to release the escrow. Let me take a moment to explain the budget effects of the CSRS escrow because there seems to be a great deal of confusion about it. When we took up the administration's proposed Postal CSRS Reform Act last year, the bill as it was written by the administration and introduced with budget neutral changes in the Senate as S380, it had a CBO estimated cost of $17 billion between 2003 and 2008 and $42 billion between 2003 and 2013. In the House, H.R. 1169 is introduced, placed the savings to ratepayers, uh, which counts as a cost in the unified budget, in escrow by requiring the Postal Service to collect the savings from its customers beginning in 2006 and not spend it without uh, prior congressional approval. This bill and the bill which eventually was enacted had a CBO estimated cost of only $7.2 billion between 2003 and 2013. Compare that to the $42 billion cost without the escrow. All we did was put off temporarily the majority of the budget hit from the Postal CSRS Reform Act as proposed by the administration. This year, the chickens are coming home to roost. Sometime in the late fall, shortly after the beginning of fiscal year 2005, the Postal Service will be filing a rate increase to take effect at the beginning of fiscal year 2006. If we have not released the escrow, that rate increase will likely include an extra two cent surcharge on the rate of a first class stamp as part of an extra 5.4 percent rate increase across the board solely to fund the escrow amount. Releasing the escrow will be a crucial component of comprehensive postal reform legislation. But the administration, according to Secretary Snow's testimony today, says they are, and I quote, 
willing to work toward a proposed modification of the Postal CSRS Funding Reform Act, abolishing that escrow that will not increase the deficit. Therefore, we expect the Administration to find the necessary offsets to accomplish this goal so that the comprehensive postal reform legislation can move forward and we won't be faced with the largest rate increase, really tax increase, uh, in postal history. If we are going to prevent a postal meltdown from happening, this is the year. For the first time since the Nixon administration, the White House has called for comprehensive postal reform. We are very fortunate to have Treasury Secretary Snow here today to present the administration's case for postal reform. We also have the guidance of the President's Commission on the Postal Service, which did an extraordinary job in a very short amount of time. We can also build on the nine years of hard work that Chairman McHugh and Chairman Burton devoted to this issue. And last but not least, our colleagues in the Senate who join us today are as committed as we are to preventing the Postal Service from melting down. I look forward to working with everyone in this room as we move toward comprehensive post reform legislation. I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing before the committee, and I look forward to their testimony. I now uh, talk, uh, call on my Senate counterpart, Senator Collins, for any opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to join Chairman Davis and my House colleagues in conducting a joint hearing on postal reform. For the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs, this represents the seventh in a series of hearings that began last September. Our Senate hearings have focused on the 35 legislative and administrative recommendations of the President's Commission on the Postal Service, recommendations that are designed to help this 225-year-old service remain viable over the long term. So much depends upon the Postal Service's continued viability. The Postal Service itself has more than 730,000 employees. Less well known is the fact that it is also the linchpin of a $900 billion mailing industry that employs 9 million Americans in fields as diverse as direct mailing, printing, catalog, production, paper manufacturing, and financial services. The health of the Postal Service is essential to thousands of companies and the millions that they employ. At our first hearing last September, the committee heard from Commission Co-Chair Jim Johnson. Commissioner Johnson made the very important point that the Postal Service's short-term fiscal health will not last and that Congress must not ignore the fundamental reality that the Postal Service as an institution is in serious jeopardy. At the committee's second hearing, we heard from the Postmaster General and the Comptroller General, David Walker. Mr. Walker of the General Accounting Office warned us about the Postal Service's $92 billion in unfunded liabilities and other obligations as set forth in the Commission's report. He pointed to a need for fundamental reforms to minimize the risk of either a significant taxpayer bailout or dramatic postal rate increases such as the Chairman has described. In February, the committee heard from representatives of the four largest postal unions, along with the Postmaster and Supervisor Associations. Earlier this month, at our fifth and sixth hearings, we heard from members of the mailing community and from postal competitors. We focused not only on the workforce and financial recommendations, but also heard testimony on the Postal Service's monopoly and mission the rate setting process, and corporate governance issues. As a senator representing a largely rural state whose citizens depend heavily on the Postal Service, I appreciate and endorse the Postal Commission's strong endorsement of the basic features of universal service, affordable rates, frequent delivery, and convenient community access to retail postal services. It's important to me that the people of my state, whether they're living near our western or northern borders, or on islands, or in our many small rural communities, have the same convenient access to postal services as the people of our cities. 
We must save and strengthen this vital institution upon which so many Americans rely for communication and for their jobs. The Postal Service has reached a critical juncture. It's time for action, both by the Postal Service and by the Congress. Senator Tom Carper and I have committed to work together with the other members of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee to draft a bipartisan postal reform bill. As this hearing is evidence of, we're also working very closely with House leaders on postal reform, including Chairman Davis and Congressman McHugh. I'm very pleased to participate in this historic joint committee hearing today. I think it shows how serious we are about accomplishing this critical task this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much. A gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to join with you in convening the first joint House and Senate hearing on the United States Postal Service. I would especially like to applaud the hard work and dedication of Senators Susan Collins, Joseph Lieberman, Ted Stevens, Daniel Okaka, and Tom Carper, leaders in the effort to reform and modernize the Postal Service. I'm proud to work with you in this effort and proud of still of the momentum we have created. Momentum which will surely lead to successful efforts to rewrite the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970. Today is an important day, not just because of the historic nature, a joint hearing on the Postal Service, but because this marks the end of hearings and signals the beginning of members and staff coming together to draft postal reform legislation. Thankfully, we have a very solid foundation upon which to build. H.R. 4970, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. Since the introduction of H.R. 4970 in the last Congress, much has taken place in the postal world. Beginning in the 108th Congress, we created a new postal panel. The Presidential Commission on the Postal Service was created and issued a report containing 35 recommendations. Those recommendations were followed by the administration's issuance of five principles of comprehensive postal legislation. Beginning this year, our postal panel held, held a series of hearings addressing various aspects of recommendations submitted by the Presidential Commission and the administration's principles for reform. And as the ranking member of the postal panel, I recently convened the Chicago Advisory Postal Group in which a number of postal reliant businesses in the Chicago area attended. The message from this group and others was that postal reform must go forward. I was pleased to note that we agreed on many important issues. Protection of universal service is a universally accepted principle. We need and must protect universal service. The postal service must have the flexibility to set rates and provide rate stability. The Postal Service cannot and must not bear the military service payment obligation. And finally, that we need to get rid of the escrow account. As we continue to work together to craft responsible postal reform legislation, I would like to commend you, Chairman Davis and Mr. McHugh, for taking the time to be engaged and provide direction and input into this valuable process. Your support and that of the mail-in community is critical if we are to be successful in passing postal reform legislation. I also want to commend uh, Mr. Waxman, who is the ranking member on our side for the leadership he has displayed throughout this process. And if we are to be successful in passing this reform legislation, then that spirit of cooperation must and I'm sure will continue. With that, I extend a warm welcome to our panelists and look forward to the participation. And thank you very much. Uh, uh, is Mr. McHugh here, Ch Chairman of our Postal Panel? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I note uh, you and uh, Senator Collins, of course, Mr. Davis, uh, covered more than adequately the full range of the issues. So what I, I would prefer to do if, with your forbearance is to 
submit my written statement uh, in its entirety for the record and uh, just make a couple of comments. First of all, I want to add my words of welcome to our Senate colleagues, particularly to uh, Senator Collins, who has done such a terrific job as, as she detailed uh, to some extent in her opening statement <clears throat> with respect to this issue. I admire her courage, her commitment, and her, her dedication to the issue. Uh, we don't expect anything less from an esteemed graduate of a great institution of higher learning like St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, which happens to be in my district, and we're very proud of that fact. <laughs> but uh, she's been a real leader, as has Senator Carper, and I've had the chance to work with Senator Carper as well for a number of years now, and uh, we're uh, very appreciative of their, uh, of their concern and their efforts. Um, <clears throat> Chairman Davis mentioned nine years. Uh, it dawned upon me that there are individuals who actually murder people who were sentenced the last time. But um, it's been an interesting journey. And I want to thank former, uh, former Chairman Burton for his role in my sentencing and for allowing me to, uh, to participate. And I, I, make, I make jest of it, but it has been one of the more fascinating journeys of, of my life. And I was thrilled when the President, uh, probably against a lot of uh, political advisors' better judgment, uh, decided that this was important enough for him to assign a, a President's Commission to not just receive those reports and findings and put them on the shelf, but to follow up with a call of reform, as he did uh, in December. And um, I, I certainly want to thank the administration for understanding, as has been stated here, how important this so-called industry, and it is an industry, but it, it is so, so massive, is to our economy. Nearly 9 percent of the gross uh, domestic product of, uh, of this nation, and, and that's incredible. Um, we can go through the details as to uh, how the canary in the mine shaft is uh, not doing well. We've seen the signs. We've had the cooperation from leaders on the Postal Service side, like the Postmaster General, like uh, the Chairman of the Board of Governors, David Feynman, uh, like the Treasury, and, and others, so many others uh, who, have, who have detailed that. But suffice it to say that uh, unlike our tendencies in Washington to react only in times of crisis, this is, this is an instance when I don't think we can afford to wait. Because by the time the crisis is f upon us and it's full-blown dimensions, um, our nation, our economy will have suffered greatly. So uh, with the cooperation of, of leaders like uh, the gentleman from Chicago, Illinois, Danny Davis, like the ranking member, Mr. Waxman, uh, and others, we've, we've tried to take this down a bipartisan path, which is what it should be. And uh, all of their cooperation and understanding, and certainly Chairman Tom Davis, uh, for uh, being gracious enough to figure out a way in which uh, I could still stay involved in this, and, and for taking the issue uh, on uh, full square has, has been a real uh, demonstration of how Congress can work effectively and on a bipartisan basis. So I look forward and certainly welcome uh, our panelists here today. And I would just note, for the record, that uh, today in, uh, in roll call, there's a full page ad uh, taken out uh, calling upon this Congress to enact reform now because it's necessary. And although there's a, a lot of great names and associations here, uh, I'd like to just name a couple uh, of the smaller ones, the American Bankers Association, American Express, Capital One, Fed, FedEx Corporation, someone uh, who provides a lot of competition to the Postal Service and, 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 a, and an interest who understands the importance of USPS to the nation, International Paper, Magazine Publishers of America, National Federation of Independent Businesses, National Retail Federation, Time Warner, and on and on and on. Those folks who understand that the economy of this nation and the, and the well-being and the way of life that the Postal Service has become for, as Senator Collins so accurately noted, well over two centuries, is at risk if we fail to do the right thing. And that's why I'm thrilled we're here for this historic, uh, for this historic uh, 
meeting and uh, look forward to the testimony of the witnesses. And with that, I yield back and thank the chairman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Norton, followed by Mr. Burton. Uh, Let me just note for the record, members will have uh, seven legislative days in which they can submit any written statements, so you don't have to feel obligated, but we've had a lot of members who put a lot of work into this and uh, want to give them an opportunity to make statements if they so desire. Ms. Norton. Mr. Chairman, uh, just let me briefly say that I think you are doing a public service uh, to the nation, you and uh, Chairwoman Collins, in calling this hearing, in my judgment, uh, this hearing may already be too late. Reading about the Postal Service is, is like reading about a failing business, or shall I say a failed business. And that may be because it is uh, not a business at all in the normal sense of the word. It is some kind of unique hybrid that Congress kind of pieced together, and we are paying the price for the kind of hybrid we put together. I mean, we act as though the Postal Service does not have tough competitors in the private sector like FedEx and UPS. Uh, we act as though uh, they don't have to provide universal service. Yes, Ms. Collins, we'll talk about the far reaches of Maine, because if you try uh, closing a post office up in some sparsely populated part of Maine, they will be on her back saying, don't close my post office. That's the difference between uh, the very successful private competitors and the Postal Service, and the Congress has acted as if there's no difference, uh, and, and the results are, are here in the figures we see and in the prospects we have. Uh, and what we see in some of these proposals, some of these proposals are indeed good, but some of these proposals read like what every failed business does. Uh, for it, it, it tries to take it out on consumers and take it out on em, em, employees. And then, of course, you get completely torn up labor relations. You try that in the post office, and I, don't like, I, don't, I think it's not a very pretty picture. And yes, uh, you, you close post offices left and right. Let me tell you about my colleagues. Uh, they'll all be calling Chairman Davis saying, not my post office. I don't know what the answer is, but I know we have blinked this crisis, and we can't blink it anymore. We need a more radical vision than I see even in the proposals before us. Um, the fact is, that there is no self-respecting nation in the world that does not provide affordable postal service. We are coming to be that nation, uh, and we have got to wake up, smell something. I'm not sure it's the coffee, and I'm not sure what we've been smoking, but we are very late to try to do something about the oldest federal agency in the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've been on the Post Office and Civil Service Committee. I know I look a lot younger, but for 20 years. <laughs> and uh, don't I look a lot younger? I thought I did. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, it, it, when I first became a member of the committee, uh, we didn't have this kind of a crisis. But with electronic uh, 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 messages being sent, with uh, the faxes being sent, we've seen a, a deterioration of the revenues coming into the Postal Service, and they're really suffering. On, on difficult times. And uh, we're, we're, we're looking at unfunded obligations now of about $90 billion. And I'd like for, to have my whole s uh, statement submitted for the Without record. Without objection. Uh, and, and, and something has to be done. You know, last year, Congressman McHugh and I and others worked very hard to get a postal reform bill passed. And we ran into a, a, a few impediments, not the least of which was uh, members of the private sector in this country who want to take over a large part of the Postal Service's business uh, doing everything they could to stop postal reform. We're at a point now, in my opinion, where we have to do something. We should have done it last year. We should have done it before that. But it's getting so bad now that I think that the Postal Service is in danger of going belly up or the taxpayers are going to have to pay a huge amount of money to bail out the Postal Service. And so something has to be done. I know there's going to be a lot of political pressure, Mr. Chairman from various entities in the private sector saying, you know, we don't want postal reform. And, and, and the main reason is because they, wanna, they want more market share. And I understand it's competition. They want to get more business. But we can't let that be the reason that we see the postal system in this country be altered to, into a situation where it's irreparably damaged and the American people suffer. So we have to do something. Congressman McHugh has done yeoman service on this, as you know. I, I applaud you and, and Senator Collins and her colleagues in the Senate for making this a top priority, and I really am happy that the administration is, is making this one of their main objectives this time. We have to do something. 
If we don't, there's going to be major postal rate increases. The deficits in the Postal Service is going to continue, and the Postal Service as we know it is going to be imperiled. Something has to be done, and I'm glad, Mr. Chairman, you're taking on this mantle of leadership right now along with Senator Collins to make sure we get that job done. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to have you uh, working with us, Chairman Byrd. I think if we've been able to get assurances of moving to this, the floor in the last Congress, we would have gotten out of committee. Uh, this time, I think we have that with the impetus from the administration if we can move it uh, through the committee. Um, Secretary Snow has a limited period of time with us, so what I'd like to do right now is swear all of the panel in, hear from Secretary Snow, have him take questions uh, from each side uh, briefly before he has to go, and understand that um, Mr. Roseborough will be here to answer questions after we hear the rest of the panel, and then we'll go on with opening statements and try to fit them in uh, appropriately, uh, if there's no objection to that. Would the panel please rise with me as I swear you in? So let me swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please be seated. And, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you uh, very much for your service to the country, uh, and uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. You have to turn your microphone on. It gets um, better. There you go. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Davis and Chairman Collins and distinguished members of the panel. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be uh, with you today to address this, uh, this overdue subject and this uh, critically important, uh, important subject. Uh, and let me say I thank you for your, your flexibility in accommodating me. I wanted to be here uh, and appreciate your, uh, your allowing me to come uh, in light of the fact that I may not be able to stay the, the whole time. Uh, but, but as you said, uh, Under Secretary Brian Roseborough, who is very knowledgeable on this subject, can speak well uh, in, my, in my absence. Uh, I'm here because I want to underscore the Bush administration's commitment to the uh, objective of, uh, of a strong, comprehensive postal reform, as uh, you said, Congressman Burton. Uh, we can't wait 20 years to get this done. We really need to get it done now. Uh, it's widely acknowledged by everybody who looks at the question that the business model of the Postal Service just doesn't work anymore. It's not uh, sustainable in light of all the technological changes and changes in the marketplace and substitutes that have come along. Uh, we need a new model. Uh, uh, the President recognized that and uh, sought to help the debate by establishing a commission which uh, a bipartisan commission to look into the question of what could be done to put the Postal Service on a, on a sound financial footing uh, so it could operate well into the 21st century and serve those important objectives that, that were mentioned in your comments. That commission uh, issued its report in July, uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, as we think about it at the Treasury Department, the most important document on postal service in 30 years. Uh, and uh, I certainly take my hat off to the, uh, to the members of that commission who did really first-rate work in, in producing their, uh, their recommendations. Uh, I wouldn't say that we endorse every one of the 35 recommendations, uh, but we believe the report as a whole is a critical building block for, uh, for the reform effort. Uh, and, of course, the leadership of the, these two committees is critical in making, uh, in making that, uh, that, that happen. Uh, we'd suggest that comprehensive postal reform ought to be what we're seeking, and it ought to be guided by five broad precepts or principles, uh, implementing best practices uh, and uh, enhancing transparency of operations, uh, providing for greater operational flexibility, uh, fostering greater accountability and ensuring self-financing. And encompassed within uh, these, uh, these larger principles, there are three specific issues uh, of great interest to the administration and I know to members of, 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 of the committees uh, because I've spoken to some of you about this. Uh, the first is the uh, appropriate allocation of the civil service retirement system military costs. Uh, a second is meeting the break-even mandate, uh, and a third is making sure there's accurate cost accounting. Uh, Congress called on the Postal Service to achieve self-financing when it passed the Postal Reorganization Act in 1970, uh, and this, this principle, uh, 
uh, uh, must be a cornerstone of any postal reform that's pursued uh, today. In order to meet the self-financing mandate, uh, we think that the postal, uh, that the pension costs for military service of postal service employees uh, should be attributed to the postal service uh, rather than to the U.S. taxpayers. Um, Congress uh, demonstrated that it shared this belief when it passed the postal service, uh, uh, postal civil service retirement uh, legislation in 2003. Uh, we would oppose any effort to shift the roughly $27 billion of pension costs connected with military service back to the taxpayers. Uh, this position, in our view, represents a fair and equitable allocation of those pension costs. Uh, it represents good government, good practice, and uh, is financially prudent. With respect to another issue that I know is on the mind of many of you, uh, the Act's provisions establishing the escrow account uh, it's important, I think, to start by noting that the administration never advocated including that provision in the final bill. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and I would say that uh, we are prepared to work with, with, with you uh, towards a modification of, uh, of uh, the Postal CSRS Funding Reform Act, abolishing the escrow in a way that, uh, that will not uh, have a serious adverse effect on the deficit, uh, as long as it's part of uh, a good overall postal reform bill. So we would look forward to working with you on, uh, on, on that. Uh, second, uh, an accurate assessment of the Postal Service's financial performance must reflect all of its liabilities, not just some of them, including any unfunded liabilities not currently reflected on the balance sheet as well as all taxpayer-funded appropriations. Finally, we'd suggest that uh, comprehensive postal reform must require the Postal Service to present more accurate uh, revenue and cost allocations. Currently, the Postal Service attributes uh, 42 percent of its total costs to general overhead, uh, only allocating 58 percent of its costs across product lines. That makes it tough to run the business well. Uh, if you can't uh, allocate your cost to the specific services for which those costs uh, are generated. Uh, and while we recognize that cost attribution is a, can be complicated for any company, particularly a company of the size and complexity of the Postal Service, uh, uh, we think that a more accurate cost uh, uh, attribution is possible and that by getting it, we could get costs and prices and profitability into, into better alignment. Uh, in our view, the Congress has a, a unique opportunity to take dec decisive action here to craft comprehensive postal reform bill that, that can lead to uh, more successful operations of the Postal Service. We continue to appreciate and endorse the effort and dedication of the Postal Service employees, its management, the Board of Governors. Uh, all of whom in, in, have made tremendous contributions to this, to this organization, and Postmaster General in particular. Uh, the, uh, I understand, and I want to compliment the Postmaster General for this, that the Postal Service is implementing all 16 recommendations of the uh, President's Commission uh, that don't require prior congressional uh, action. That's much to be commended. Uh, let me close by saying that uh, the administration is, is anxious to work with you to uh, uh, craft a reform bill uh, framed in accordance with these principles that I outlined. Uh, we recognize that uh, uh, it will require shared sacrifice from, from everybody, from all the shareholders, uh, but we, we have an opportunity here to put in place something that uh, will stand the test of time in this enormously dynamic uh, market. So I regret that I won't be able to be with you for the full length of the hearing, uh, but I do look forward to, uh, to being part of the effort to bring about significant, far-reaching, comprehensive postal reform. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know uh, you need to leave in a couple minutes. I wonder if you could just uh, to try to stay for a couple minutes and ask some questions, or you can deflect them to Secretary okay. Roseborough if you think that's more appropriate, but I want to recognize Senator Collins. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Snow, over the past several months that we've been holding hearings, we've heard from many different parties expressing many different views. We've heard from the Postal Service unions, the associations, the CEOs of major companies such as Time Inc. and R.R. Donnelly. We've heard from representatives of the newspaper and direct marketing associations. And they had very different views, in some cases, on what should be done. But there were two issues that united every single witness who has testified before our committee in these six previous hearings. And that is the two issues that they all have in common are a desire to see the escrow account repealed and the return of the military pension obligation to the Treasury Department. This morning, or this afternoon, rather, you have praised, and justifiably so, the fine work of the President's Commission. And as you're well aware, those recommendations were part of the Commission's recommendations as well. So the administration's a pretty lonely voice on those two issues. I do recognize that the bill that the administration proposed to correct the overfunding of the pension system did not include an escrow account because I introduced the administration's bill. I don't understand why today you have said that removing the escrow account, which was not part of the administration's original bill, uh, must be done so in a deficit neutral position. This is an overfunding that the OPM and OMB identified in which we've corrected. It doesn't make sense to lock up that money and prevent the Postal Service from using it. That's my first concern. And then if there's time, okay. I'd like to turn to the military pension issue. Well, as I understand it, the, that's roughly $3 billion in the escrow account today. And well, the escrow account grows in future years if grow. we don't remedy this right, problem. Right. But that is money that, that, as we keep score on the federal deficit, uh, goes into the plus column today. And if the monies are allowed to, to flow out of the escrow account, they would be charged against the deficit and add $3 billion to the deficit. That's the basic issue we have with the escrow account. And as I say, I'd be willing to work to find an offset uh, uh, for the $3 billion, but, but we, we, we'd, we'd be, uh, we'd be uh, much happier about the prospect of the escrow account uh, solution you want if there were an offset. Secretary Roseborough, did you want to add to that? Oh, yes. just. Uh, and consistent with the Secretary's remarks, anything that increases the you know, budget deficit increases basically the burden on taxpayers, and that is just fundamentally inconsistent with the principle uh, the President has laid down in terms of the Postal Service being self-financing, as well as the original principle of postal reform from the early 1970s of the Postal Service being self-financing. Uh, so as indicated, uh, while we recognize the difficult accounting nature of uh, dealing with this particular aspect. Uh, we would prefer to focus on economic exposure and how that could be adversely affected on the taxpayer, but we'll be more than willing and anxious to work with uh, the committee to find some type of resolution to the problem. Well, I'm eager to work with you to resolve this issue because I think it's absolutely critical. But it, it really is not relevant to the break-even mandate of the Postal Service. This was legislation that corrected an overfunding by the Postal Service to the retirement system. So to say that we've corrected that, but then we're locking up the money and not allowing it to be spent to, for example, fund retire retiree health care benefits, pay down the debt to the Treasury, or to remove the need for a dramatic increase in postal rates, to me, just doesn't make sense. It contradicts the entire purpose of the legislation that we passed at the administration's request last year. So we don't disagree in principle. We, we do have that issue of the $3 billion hit to the, to the accounts of the United States. 
And as I said, we're, we're prepared to work to try and find some offsets for that. But uh, uh, in principle, we're not disagreeing with you. I see that I have three seconds left, so I will yield back the balance of my time um, and hope that the military pension issue will be addressed by others. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Secretary. I'll just ask one question in, in terms of along the same lines. If we should shift the, the military retirement cost to the ratepayers, then if, if, if we can't shift it to the taxpayers, then more than likely it gets shifted to the ratepayers. Would that not put the Postal Service in worse shape in terms of perhaps negating the possibility of some business that could be done that would not be done? Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, you, you raise a good point. How would the uh, 27 billion be amortized or, or dealt with. Uh, it's uh, this is something that uh, Under Secretary Roseboro has looked at uh, in broad outline. Uh, it would have to come through greater efficiencies, perhaps some uh, uh, phasing in of some some pricing increases over time. But w as we look at the situation, there are considerable opportunities, and I think uh, the Postmaster General would agree. Considerable opportunities for further efficiencies uh, within the organization itself that would absorb some considerable part of those, of, of, those, uh, of those costs. But my learned colleague can give you a better answer than I can on Thank that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, I know you got you to run, and uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you. And, and uh, Mr. Rowe, we'll allow that. I think what I want to do, uh, Mr. Davis, okay with you, is go on. Um, before we proceed, everybody's sworn. See if any other members want to make opening statements, and let's move that out of the way, and then we can get to the testimony of the rest of the panel. Then, Mr. Roseburg, we have obviously have some some cleanup work to do uh, following that. Uh, some questions from some of the panel members. Uh, I know. Okay, Mr. Rupersberger. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Great to have you here and joining together in this bipartisan issue. Uh, we're here today to explore what legislative changes are necessary to ensure the U.S. Postal Service continues to serve the best interest of the American public. Now, because the Postal Service is a $900 billion industry that employs more than 9 million people, we can all agree our objective is to stabilize the Postal Service and secure its future. As we consider options for reforming the U.S. Postal Service, it is crucial to recognize our nation's shifting economic, commercial, and technological conditions. Hard copy communications have been affected by the use of fax machines and a variety of electronic communications, including the Internet. The United States Postal Service faces increased competition, as we know, from private delivery companies and also the challenges of operating during an economic slump. Mail volume has declined during each of the fiscal years 2001, 2002, 2003, and the service has lost $2.3 billion in the last three years. The financial problems of the postal industry, however, must not be imposed on the backs of the men and women who have made the U.S. Postal Service the best postal service in the world. As our national unemployment rate continues to climb, we must protect the job security of the postal employees, including their retirement, health benefits, and workers' compensation. In addition, we must consider the impact of postal reform on individuals and small businesses. Cutbacks on services, charges and delivery, and post office closures could unfairly burden our communities, both rural, suburban, and urban. Lastly, we must not overlook the U.S. Postal Service's uncertain funding for emergency preparedness. It has been more than two years since our country was brutally attacked by the terrorists on September 11, 2003, and other issues involving anthrax. We live in an era of uncertain threat levels and must ensure the U.S. Postal Service has the resources to keep their employees, our families, and our communities safe. Thank you very much. Any other members? Uh, Ms. Miller, you want to make an opening statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I certainly appreciate your commitment to reforming the postal system. I'd like to thank my esteemed colleague from New York as well, Mr. McHugh. Didn't realize he had a nine-year sentence to uh, postal reform here, so we're looking forward to a successful conclusion of all of that. And I certainly would like to extend my thanks to Senator uh, Collins for uh, joining us today and certainly her commitment as well. Uh, as a president, I'm certainly with all of this. We can uh, we can get reform uh, a reform initiative signed into law before the end of the year. 
You know, the Postal Service is such an important element of our society, as everybody has uh, said here. It is actually over 8 percent of the nation's gross national product, which is a startling number. And certainly individuals and businesses rely on it each and every day. And for this reason, any consideration of reform certainly has to be sensitive to the needs of consumers, both individuals and businesses. In addition, I think that the reform needs to be sensitive as well to all of our postal workers. And I don't think that can be stressed enough. These are the people who make sure that your magazines are arriving in your home or your apartment or what have you every single day that they show up every week. They make sure your bills are paid in time. These are the people that uh, uh, really make it work. And sometimes I think that uh, we take our postal workers and our service for granted there. But I, I certainly want to thank the men and women who work every day to make it uh, so reliable. And, uh, and I do think sometimes we have a tendency to want to say that the Postal Service is a very large and inefficient government bureaucracy. But I think uh, when you think for 37 cents I can put a, uh, a something in the mail in Macomb County, Michigan, where I live, and in several day days it will arrive anywhere in the continental United States. I think that is really remarkable. So I think it is important to note that the Postal Service is not broke, but it needs to be improved. And I think the largest room, no matter what business you are involved in, is certainly the room for improvement. So I want to thank all the witnesses for testifying today. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you thank know. you to Senator Collins for coming to, to join us today. Um, I have a statement that I will uh, give for the record, but just very briefly to touch on a couple of things. I do want to thank our witnesses, and I want to thank the members of the Postal Service, the employees of the Postal Service from my district who care deeply about reform and have come to join us today. Uh, we are all concerned with what we have seen happen with the Postal Service's financial health over the past decade and the deterioration that has taken place there. And I think as we have held the hearings in the House and the Senate, there are three areas where we have looked at that are in need of crucial reform. First, the Postal Service must develop a 21st century business model. And the service is operating in 2004 as it did in the 1970s, and we know that that is very difficult uh, for the Postal Service and for the taxpayers. Second, the Postal Service must have financial transparency, and proper financial management enables executive officers to make sound financial decisions, and it allows new reforms to take hold, and that is something that is essential. And also, we think that it is essential that an extensive independent audit must be taken as soon as possible so the Postal Service can be held accountable for its operations and the waste and inefficiencies can be identified and targeted for elimination. And third, the Postal Service must contain its labor cost. Eighty percent of its total expenses for last year were for labor, and this stands in stark contrast to some of the commercial mailing enterprises which we have heard from during the course of our uh, hearings. Uh, again, I want to thank the Chairman for his leadership, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, and we look forward to working with you and hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carper and then Mr. Clay. Got to remember to turn these uh, switches on. It's been a while. Since. Uh, to our colleagues here in the House of Representatives, to my chairman, uh, Susan Collins, it's great to see you with you. all of you, to our witnesses, especially our, uh, our general. Uh, thank you for, for being here today. I uh, um, remember walking in this building, gosh, how long ago was it? 1965. 1965, I was a uh, uh, freshman at Ohio State University, Navy ROTC uh, midshipman. And uh, we had spring break. I didn't have enough money to go to Florida for spring break, and I ended up uh, taking a free, all-expenses-paid trip to Quantico, Virginia <laughs> to, uh, to see if I wanted to go up and be a, a Marine officer. And I uh, ended up, I, I endured the trip. I have great respect for Marines then and still do. But I endured the trip uh, just so I'd have a chance to maybe get uh, out of Quantico one afternoon and uh, to come to Washington, D.C. And lo and behold, I did. And I, uh, a bunch of my buddies and I uh, got on a train in uh, Quantico and came on up here to D.C. They went up to Georgetown to get into trouble. And uh, I came to Capitol Hill and uh, ended up wandering into this building in uh, spring break, 1965. And uh, there was a hearing going on. Uh, everything else was shut down around the Capitol. There was a hearing going on in this building, on, I think on this floor, just down the hall. And it was a Judiciary Committee hearing. And I think the chairman was a guy named Emanuel Seller. I think he was the chairman. And they were having hearings on the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Remember him? And uh, that was my introduction to. And I said I left, uh, I left uh, to my, my colleague Ed uh, Towns, with whom I came here in 
Congress. And I said when I left that day to go back to Quantico with my buddies and said, did you guys have a good time? They had a great time in Georgetown. They wanted to know if I did too. And I said, yep. I said, someday I'd like to come back and work in this town. And uh, it's great to be back in this building where we sort of all started uh, several decades ago. Well, I, uh, to, to my colleagues, especially my old colleague, uh, Ed Towns, um, it's just a, it's an honor to be here. This, this uh, postal reform issue has been with us, been with us for a, a while, as you know, and uh, I hope that we can do work that's as good as that done by uh, Ted Stevens uh, almost three and a half decades ago. In fact, he did his work just shortly after I was here as a, uh, as a Navy ROTC midshipman. And uh, we want to be able to build on good work that's done, been done by Congressman McHugh and those who've helped him shape his legislation. As my colleagues are aware, this will likely be the final hearing I think we're going to hold um, following the recommendations from the President's Postal Commissions. And I think it's a good sign that we're all here, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, uh, united in the belief that uh, we need to make some fundamental changes to the way our Postal Service does business in the 21st uh, century. Uh, by all accounts, the Postal Service has been a success since it was created. I think even its detractors would, ad uh, would admit that. It receives virtually no taxpayer support, and it services hundreds of thousands of employees to provide uh, to nearly every American, nearly every day, that service is second to none. And more than 30 years after its birth, the Postal Service is a key part of our nation's economy delivering to more than 100 million addresses and supporting a massive mailing industry. And even a casual observer, uh, however, could see that the past few years haven't been easy ones for the Postal Service. And as we learn in our hearings in government affairs on the other side of the Capitol, they've been difficult for private firms, large and small, and for the millions of mailing industry employees who depend on stable postal rates. I'm pleased that uh, we have this once-in-a-generation opportunity maybe once in a two-generation opportunity, now to work in a bipartisan way to modernize the Postal Service and to update its business model for the 21st century. At the end of last year, as we all know, President Bush issued a set of postal reform principles focused on those recommendations from his Postal Commission, aimed at improving transparency and accountability at the Postal Service and giving management the increased flexibility that they need to streamline operations and seek out new mail volumes. And his principles touch on the main themes addressed in uh, S-1285 uh, and in uh, Congressman McHugh's latest bill. Well, I think it's safe to say, my friends, that as uh, I've said before, that we probably have agreement on 90 percent of what ought to be in a new postal reform bill. And now that our hearing work is just about complete, I look forward to sitting down with you, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, to our friends here in the House, Congressman McHugh, and uh, our other interested colleagues to uh, put together a bill that uh, is a worthy successor to that hammered out 40 years ago by junior Senator Ted Stevens. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to claim my time. I appreciate that. Uh, it's an honor to participate in today's hearing on developing principles for meaningful postal reform uh, with our Senate colleagues. I would also like to extend thanks to today's witnesses uh, this historic meeting leaves no uncertainty about the willingness of Congress to address the important issue of postal reform. Postal reform has presented us with a unique opportunity to craft legislation that would modernize our postal system to become more customer friendly and efficient in the 21st century. Still, there are many components of postal reform that have yet to be resolved, such as the civil service retirement system, military obligation, and the fair and equitable treatment of postal workers, to name a few. The U.S. Postal Service is no ordinary business enterprise. It is a government entity with no shareholders that provides a commercial service which operates under a break-even mandate and pays no federal, state, or local taxes. It is truly unique. Uh, fundamental reform is sorely needed to bring the service into the information age. We must examine further efforts to cut costs while maintaining service and preserving universal delivery. I trust that as a body we will take the time to resolve our differences on the issue of postal reform. Simply put, we owe that commitment to both ratepayers and taxpayers. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses and ask unanimous, unanimous consent to enter my statement into the record. Thank Without you. objection, so ordered. Any other members wish to make opening uh, statements at this point? 
If not, uh, again, we have seven. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Towns. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, let me thank you for holding uh, this joint hearing today on the very important issue of postal reform. This has been a thorough and informative process, and I feel confident that both sides are well prepared to fashion a bill that will put the Postal Service on firm ground for years to come. The Postal Service is truly a precipitous point, as it is quickly heading down a path which is economically unsustainable. Each year, the Postal Service adds nearly 2 million new homes, businesses, or other new delivery points. However, at the same time, mail volume has been declining for three straight years. While some of that decrease is due to the recent economic recession, a significant portion of the decline is due to structural changes that are only going to become more pronounced. Overall, the Postal Service has lost $2.3 billion, that's B as in boy, in the last three years. We have bought some time by passing the Civil Service Retirement System Funding Act, which saved more than $6 billion for the last two years. But we cannot allow this breathing room to deter us from making important but tough decisions. Our constituents are depending on us as well as the Postal Service and the mailing industry. Together, this enterprise comprises a nearly $900 billion industry employing 9 million workers nationwide and representing more than 8 percent of the gross domestic product. So a failure to act will have wide-ranging consequences. As I have said before, there is significant room for agreement on a vast majority of issues, such as the escrow account and the military pension issues. In areas of limited disagreement, I strongly believe that a compromise can be forged that increases the efficiency and effectiveness of the Postal Service, accommod accommodates the needs of the mailing industry, and at the same time protect our postal workers. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about their views on what principles should guide our committees in writing a final postal reform bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time, and I'm glad to see uh, that uh, Senator Carper made his way over. It shows you that this is an important issue. Thank you very much. Um, members will have seven legislative days to put uh, statements in, and we'll proceed to the panel now. And I think, uh, uh, Mr. Feynman, we'll start with you and then to uh, Mr. Potter, to you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Rosberg, do you want to make any intro remarks, or are you just here to be the flag catcher for the Secretary? Privileged to have the best job in the world doing this, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'll report back. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Um, I, um, as most of you know, I'm Chairman of the Board of Governors of the United States Postal Service, um, and I have served a sentence with Congressman McHugh for the last eight or nine years we've, we've been together. Um, my term expires on December 8th of this year. And I, this will probably, as I said to Congressman McHugh a little bit earlier, probably be the last time that I have an opportunity to testify uh, before the committee, because I, I look forward to this committee going into hard work to get a bill out and probably won't need too much more testimony. Um, I want to take this opportunity just to thank Congressman Davis, uh, Senator Collins, Senator Carper, uh, Cong Congressman Danny Davis also, and people who have worked so hard on this legislation. Congressman McHugh and I were lonely voices, I think, about eight years ago or so, um, saying that we thought that there was going to be a problem. And the last time I testified, Senator Carper, I said that you and I both take the train. As you know, I come from Philadelphia. We both take that train coming in the Northeast Extension, and, the, and last time I said that there was a train wreck about ready to happen, and I thought the train was probably in Baltimore and coming down into Union Station, and I guess uh, might be at BWI now as it keeps going down. It's not yet ready to come into Union Station, but it's pretty close. Um, as I listened to Secretary Snow's remarks, I thought uh, back upon the eight years or so that I've been on the board. And I think the remarks about uh, the pension and the funding of it reflect what is such a tough job here, uh, understanding what the board does. You know, um, at one point, 
the legislation that you presently have says that, well, we have to run this like a business. And we do try our hardest to run this like a large business would be run. Many of us have sat on public boards before. Um, but at the same time, you take an issue like the like pension. I mean, I think it's just a good example. Other businesses, you know, you don't fund what are uh, your military obligations by the business itself. I mean, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Um, you want us to act like a business and be independent at the same time you say we have certain obligations. We understand the obligation of universal service. But at the same time, um, if we're going to be self-sustaining, we should be really self-sustaining. Uh, I'm a lawyer by trade. I, I, the $3 billion word was put into a escrow fund. That means the way I practice law, that it's sitting there just waiting for something to happen. That something was Congress, Congress wanted a report from us as to how we were going to use that money. We gave that report. Chairman Davis reported back to us at least today that they were satisfied with what the report was that we gave. It seems to me that the escrow then gets broken, similar to the way you do a real estate deal. You put some money in escrow, the escrow gets broken, and it goes to one of the parties. This is no different. You asked us for something, we set it aside, and it's obvious to us, and obvious, I think, to this panel, that that money should be given to us. And while we talk about the escrow fund, it is the, we're coming to a point in time where Congressman McHugh, the main issue that he and I spoke about for the last eight years was the rate-making process. And the rate-making process is broken. It doesn't work. I'm a lawyer. I was interested in 1965. I graduated from George Washington Law School in 1970, the same year that this act came into existence. I kind of wish I knew about it. I've called it the Lawyer's Welfare Act of 1970. You know, to a large degree, that's what happens. It churns litigation. It churns the ability to set rates. And there is another process that can happen. You've all heard about it, be heard me talk about it before, and you've all had proposals, and I think it will happen. But you take this, you take the escrow fund, look at the position we are in today as, a, as the chairman of the board. I have a fiduciary obligation to the American public, to the Postal Service, to the ratepayers. We are going to have to act on rates probably sometime in November. If we don't know whether or not this $3 billion is coming back into our coffers, we are going to have to do something. I mean, it's not a threat, it's not a promise, it's just reality. It's just the way the system works. The system shouldn't work this way. There should be another rate-making process, and I would hope that you would attack it. The last thing I'd like to comment upon, um, and I think that I have the right to do it <laughs> as the chairman of the board, is about governance issues. Um, I do want to thank the president um, for putting together this presidential commission, and the people over at Treasury worked so hard um, on that within a short period of time. I was amazed that they could come out with their report within the short period of time that they worked. However, the one issue where I do disagree with the board, with the President's Commission is deals with governance issues. And the reason that I disagree is that the manner in which the directors are chosen, and as Congressman McHugh knows, I couldn't care less whether you call us governors, directors, or whatever. The manner in which they're chosen could cause a partisan board to come into existence under the formula selected by the Presidential Commission. My experience has been that there are, these are not Democrat nor Republican issues, and it's reflected in the bipartisan nature of, of whom I testify before today, and it's reflected in the bipartisan nature of our board. Uh, Congressman Carper's good friend, a Republican, uh, Bob Ryder from Delaware, the former chairman of this board, he and I were confirmed on the same day. There are no issues between us that are Republican and Democrat. 
and I would hate to see this board formulated into a manner in which there could be either a Republican board or a Democratic board, depending on who the president is. And I, I, I ask you very much to give that a little bit of your attention. And with that, I know that we, uh, there are many of you here today, and many of you might have questions, so I want to cut my remarks short. And thank you again. Um, thank Chairman Davis and two senators uh, for calling this um, meeting. Um, you know, it, kid from Philadelphia in a row house, I kind of pinch myself a little bit that I am in some ways helping to make history. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. General Potter, thanks for being with us. Thanks for the job you've done. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis, Chairman Collins, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to come before you today as we continue to discuss the critical need for comprehensive reform of the legislative framework governing the Postal Service. I'm especially grateful to Chairman Collins and Chairman Davis for your active leadership on postal legislative reform and for providing the opportunity for all stakeholders in the mailing community to voice their needs, preferences, and common commitment to postal reform. And while I'm at it, I want to thank everyone on the committee. Uh, a lot of accolades have already been said, and I just want to echo them. Uh, let me begin by saying, first of all, how proud I am of postal employees, all the men and women who work for the Postal Service. They're doing a great job, and, and I'm very proud of what they're doing. We have seen service performance rise to record levels. Customer satisfaction is at an all-time high, and we've had an unprecedented four straight years of productivity improvement. Our employees are delivering for America. And speaking of delivering for America, the Postal Service is most grateful to the administration and Congress for the civil service retirement legislation passed last year. The legislation enabled us to reduce our outstanding debt by one-third and will help us hold rates stable through to, until 2006. That legislation left two open issues to be addressed this year, namely the obligation for military benefits and the escrow. As we've previously testified, the Postal Service believes it should not be responsible for funding civil service retirement benefits earned by postal employees while they served in the military. This $27 billion obligation includes a $7 billion reimbursement to the Treasury for payments made to retirees since 1971, as well as $10 billion interest on those payments. There is also an additional $10 billion in cost to cover future benefits for existing employees' military service. We disagree with the shift in the obligation from the taxpayer to the ratepayer. The legislation also requires the Postal Service to create an escrow account from savings resulting from the legislation. The simple fact is that under present postage rates, there will be no funds available after 2005 to place in an escrow account. The monies needed for the escrow fund equate to a 5.4 percent rate increase. I don't believe a rate increase is good for the recovering economy or for the mailing industry or for the long-term future of universal service as we know it today. Therefore, I strongly urge the elimination of the escrow requirement. Let me now turn to key priorities we believe should be addressed in your deliberations on postal legislative legislation. First and foremost, we believe that we must have the flexibility to adjust rates to meet the varying demands of customers. Mailers have long told us that small annual price increases are preferred to price shock every couple of years. Annual increases could be more easily absorbed in their business plans. Conversely, the public prefers a uniform rate for a single piece first class mail that would change less frequently. The current rate making system does not allow us to accommodate these varying preferences. We recommend that a model that gives the governors of the Postal Service the authority to set prices with an after-the-fact review process that addresses issues such as cost coverage, consumer interests, and impact on competition would be beneficial. In the related area of price caps, my concern is that given the volatility of today's marketplace, an imperfectly crafted price cap could be harmful. To guard against that concern, we propose that the price cap be constructed to recognize the many cost factors which enter into the rate-making process, many of which are beyond our control. Specifically, 
We propose that in addition to a metric for wage growth, a realistic price cap would also account for delivery network expansion, fuel price volatility, and most importantly, legislatively mandated employee benefits. Second, it's essential that we have flexibility to adjust our national infrastructure, our retail and processing networks to meet changing customer preferences and market conditions. Many postal retail services are now conveniently available online in grocery stores and other private sector retail outlets and through the mail. We should not be expected to retain all our post offices simply because they have always been there. Likewise, sorting capability continues to be increasingly more efficient. This combined with the potential loss in mail volume requires an evolving processing network to minimize cost. Third, it is essential that the Postal Service be given greater latitude to manage and control costs. Despite our success in reducing costs over the past four years, the fact remains that a significant portion of our costs are imposed on us by legislation. If reform is to succeed, those costs must be addressed. For example, federal statute gives the Department of Transportation authority to set the rate we pay airlines for international mail transportation. International mail is a highly competitive area. We should be able to negotiate directly with airlines in the same way we do in contracting for domestic air transportation costs. It's more businesslike and provides us an opportunity to reduce costs which ultimately benefit the marketplace. When you look at postal expenses as a whole, employee benefits are the single largest cost category that today is beyond our control. Benefits such as retirement contributions, health benefits, life insurance, retiree health benefits, and workers' compensation are mandated by statute. Collectively last year, they amounted to more than $13 billion in costs. We propose that collective bargaining process, which covers almost 90 percent of our career workforce, be expanded to include the negotiation of benefits in addition to wages, hours and conditions of employment. In short, everything should be on the table. Finally, I would like to comment on a statement to the Committee on Government Affairs earlier this month by uh, UPS Chairman and CEO Mike Eskew. I quote, the Postal Service's mail monopoly allows it to subsidize competitive, competitive products and inappropriately compete with the private sector. His statement misses the mark on both counts. First, the Postal Service's monopoly on letter mail does not subsidize competitive products. Cross-subsidization is against the law, and in a nation of laws, we are not in the business of breaking the law. Second, a principal duty of the Independent Postal Rate Commission is to ensure that cross-subsidization doesn't occur. With an, our arduous rate-making process, if there were cross-subsidization, one or more of the rate interveners would point that out to the PRC. I would add that in 2003, our competitive products, Express Mail, Priority Mail, and Package Services, earned $2.5 billion over and above their direct costs. The funds were made from Express Mail, Priority Mail, and Package Services, and they were used to finance universal service. Terms like inappropriate competition are easy to toss around, but they often ignore an important lesson of history. At the turn of the century by law, the Postal Service, the Post Office Department at the time, could not carry parcels weighing more than four pounds. Only private express companies delivered larger packages. But then more than half of the American public lived in rural areas and received little or no parcel delivery from private carriers. Those who did had to pay exorbitant rates for their service. When the Parcel Post Act of 1912 was enacted, all that changed. For the first time in history, all Americans, from those living in major urban centers to residents in remote rural areas, were able to use the mail to receive the goods they needed at affordable prices. Today, the Postal Service to continues to deliver to every address in the country without residential or rural surcharges that are increasingly common by other co companies. In fact, recently, the elected public officials of Pasco, Washington, protested such surcharges of a dollar for business delivery and a dollar seventy-five for residential delivery. Pasco has a metropolitan area of more than 150,000 people. The lesson is clear: we have an opportunity and obligation to preserve and protect universal mail service in this country. 
the right and privilege of every American to receive reliable, efficient, affordable mail service, regardless of their, where they live or do business. I believe that this is the legacy we must preserve for our future generations, a legacy that will be preserved only if we have the courage, determination, and vision to enact legislation that will truly help us build a stronger postal service in the future. Thank you, Chairman Collins. Thank you, Chairman Davis, and the rest of the committees for your interest in the Postal Service. Thank you very much. Let me ask uh, uh, Mr. Resborough. Um, I heard this, the Secretary's testimony about the escrow money uh, and the deficit. But this really is a deficit of money. This is, this is postal ratepayers' money they paid into the fund, right? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, this well, is. Why would you use it for other? Per I mean, I don't think we ought to be under the illusion this money is going to be paid to, for the Defense Department or the Education Department. These are postal dollars paid by ratepayers under some, under a fund that's akin to an enterprise fund. And uh, I'm under state law in Virginia, if I'd taken money from an enterprise fund and used it or amassed it for anything else, uh, I would go to jail. But at the federal level, we don't have those rules. So you can sit here and use this to, quote, mask a deficit when it's, it's, it's phony baloney. This is, these are postal dollars that ought to ultimately be used uh, for the post office. And, I, and I'm trying to understand, for $3 billion, uh, this, uh, which is what's in there now, why don't we just call, us, call it to what it is in the postal dollars and release it? You're absolutely correct in uh, the perspective. You would you know, look at this $3 billion, which would grow in terms of the escrow uh, structure. Uh, while I would say, however, I disagree that it is attempting to mask uh, any deterioration in the deficit. What I'm concerned from a budget scoring proposition, a uh, budget scoring proposition that was built into the last year's uh, legislation, uh, is that it remain a preference, strong preference that it remain budget neutral. And to accomplish that from a budget scoring perspective, that is where we think we need to aid the committee, aid the Congress in trying to determine what makes sense, what, if anything, can work, and where we're willing to lend a hand. But isn't it budget neutral simply because uh, the way that the scorers look at these things, they had counted this money as general, basically general fund money, and if you shift it to the post office, then uh, it shows up as a deficit on the general fund side, and it's used for postal. Am, am I understanding it right? The, it, it is an accounting budget scoring uh, issue, absolutely, sir. So the alternative, if you, if you keep it neutral, is that ratepayers would have to pay an additional 3 to $4 billion a year. Uh, not for any purpose that has anything to do with postal service or its employees, uh, but basically for, for to to uh, reduce uh, the deficit. And the alternative then is you raise postal rates, which has a. I mean, you talk about a tax increase. That's what postal rates are. You talk about trying to get jobs in this country. That's a job killer, in, in my opinion. Now, what am I missing here? Uh, we would look at it as that isn't necessarily only alternative that uh, could be structured, and again would work to explore other reasonable alternatives that do not have that outcome which uh, you just outlined. Okay. I, I'm just, I, I hear you. And I r really appreciate the uh, Secretary's uh, remarks about how he wants to look at finding offsets with us. And, you know, we, I guess if we have to do that, that's what we have to do. But it just seems so much cleaner and straighter and, and more, you know, more honest to just say these are postal dollars and we're going to release it and let the chips fall where they may on the uh, uh, on the budget, because ultimately these are dollars that shouldn't be put in the same fund as taxpayer dollars. These are ratepayer dollars, and we, the way the Postal Act is set up is the post office could pay for itself. Now you're saying dollars that they generate, uh, we're going to take those dollars away and put them over here, so at least for accounting purposes, these look like dollars that are raised from income tax. Uh, well, again, we think there may be other alternatives, and uh, again, in terms of exploring those options, in terms of those dollars being directed towards other postal obligations, uh, the frequently mentioned here uh, unfunded obligations of substantial nature. Uh, Let me ask you this. What would a 5.4 percent across the board postal rate increase do to the economy? Uh, we think that uh, any increase would not be a good thing. However, uh, recognizing the reality of other options being available, other levers to push uh, in a structure in a business of 42% uh, unallocated costs, 
that there could not be explored, could not be found, other cost-saving measures as okay. we've pushed for the Postal Service to have flexibility uh, with regard to technology, with regard to workforce issues where it has a great opportunity in the coming years with regard to natural attrition, uh, eligibility for retirement increasing. Uh, we think it's not a, just a, a binary issue of raising rates or uh, pushing the expense onto the taxpayer. We think there are some other options that could be practically explored. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I am encouraged by the fact that you want to work with us and you recognize the problem at the end of the day if we just leave those dollars over there without finding some other way. And we look, we look uh, you know, I like the straight up way of doing it. That's kind of, mm -hmm. but we look forward to working with you on that and uh, appreciate your uh, commitment. To, uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Potter, Secretary uh, Snow indicated that there were still efficiencies to be found in the Postal Service. Um, would you comment on where some of those might be? Over the past uh Over the past three years, we have worked very hard to, to find productivity improvements uh, throughout our, our system. Uh, some of the cost saving uh, opportunities are in the supplies and services, the transportation that we procure, uh, some of the services that we buy, such as leases on buildings. Uh, in the past three years, we've managed to, to reduce our spend on that by over a billion dollars. In addition to that, we've taken out uh, over $1.7 billion worth of labor costs uh, simply by managing our, our, our business better. We've done an internal benchmarking program uh, that uh, has our employees focused on productivity and our employees are stepping up to the plate. Uh, so I see productivity improvement opportunities in every operation that we have. I think our employees are engaged in that. and. Uh, the product is, is what you see. You see a reduced uh, workforce uh, that's taking on additional work and uh, productivity growing. Um, so I see opportunities in delivery. I see opportunities in mail processing operation. I see opportunities in all the supplies and services that we buy. Uh, and we have a very broad program. As the Secretary said, there are 16 areas that were recommended to us by the President's Commission, and we're exploring each and every one of those opportunities. If we were to try to make up the $27 billion in uh, military retirement costs, do uh, you have any idea how long that might take using these efficiencies? Being extremely aggressive, uh, we're able to take about a billion dollars in costs out a year without disrupting the service to the American public. And service is our number one goal in our organization. And we don't want to do anything dramatic that, that would cause us to uh, uh, disrupt service. Uh, I think the horizon is decades in terms of getting after the $27 billion on top of what we've already planned to do, uh, because our plan calls for a billion dollars in savings over the, each of the next three years in order to try and mitigate uh, increases in postage. Uh, Mr. Roseborough, do you think that those are the kind of efficiencies that uh, the Secretary had in mind? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as was indicated, the Postal Service has made a great start. There is still uh, room for considerable improvement uh, looking forward. Um, with regard uh, to your specific concern, uh, and joint uh, Postmaster General Potter ends with the Secretary before he left about the you know, $27 billion being shifted over uh, to the Post Office. Uh, if I may sort of put that into a context, uh, which will hopefully help make clear our position on that and why we think that is reasonable. Uh, first, we look at it in the context of the legislation that was passed last year, last, year, last April, uh, a package of reform, a package of reform that was quite unique in that the Postal Service was a beneficiary of a dynamic analysis with regard to its pension funding uh, that effectively resulted in, even with the obligation as the legislation passed last year required for the Postal Service to pay the $27 billion in military funding, uh, it still received a net gain of $78 billion. 
And even with that $27 billion, I'd like to just note that this has also got lost. There is still an obligation by the Treasury taxpayer to pay close to $21 billion of military obligations. So as a package, uh, it was fair, reasonable, as well as consistent with establishing uh, the postal SERS system uh, consistent with the Federal Employee Retirement System or the FERS system where there is a requirement to pick up the military obligations by agencies and the Postal Service now has, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Postmaster Potter, of over 500,000 of its employees are now under the FERS system. Uh, so from our perspective, that was very important. But with regard to looking forward and in managing the $27 billion liability, I would say actually the challenge is greater than that. There is the additional $60 billion in unfunded health care liabilities, $7 billion in unfunded workers' compensation liabilities, a uh, little under $6 billion in unfunded pension liabilities still. Uh, all of those we feel needs to be addressed and, as practically speaking, made part of a rate case, uh, recognizing the impracticality of looking to do anything dramatic soon and cause any type of a spike in rates. Uh, we think we can work with the Postal Service through the Office of Personnel Management, for example, to devise a, a prudent amortization plan over the long term, because these are long-term liabilities, uh, to minimize any shock, as well as and also be able to gain some of the cost-saving uh, opportunities that the Postal Service is now and in the future will be pursuing. Thank you very much. It sounds like we're saying that no matter what we're able to do, we're still going to be woefully short and are going to have to come up with something else. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, very, Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Postmaster General, one of the troubling developments that you've had to deal with is the decline in the volume of first class mail in each of the last three years. Could you tell the committee what your forecast is for the next year or so as far as uh, the volume of first class mail? Are you projecting further declines? We're projecting that uh, next year, and we're working very hard to do this, uh, we're, we're projecting that volume will be flat, if not grow a little. And th the reason we do, and that's only in the next year, uh, is because of the recovering economy and efforts that we're making, the efforts that our employees have made to improve service and to reach out to customers. However, when you look further beyond that, the structural change, the movement of what is a hard copy, uh, communication today, it could be a bill or a payment that's done via the mail, we see the structural change of that migrating to the Internet continuing. And so in the short term, given the fact that we're rebounding, for, the economy is rebounding, uh, we're not as hard pressed as we might be in future years. Uh, and we're preparing ourselves for the future. And that's why we're counting on postal reform to give us the flexibility to react to what we anticipate will be some significant changes in our mail mix. And if, in fact, you had to file for a 5.4 percent increase in postal rates because reform was not forthcoming and the escrow account remained in place, wouldn't that likely drive down the volume of mail still further and create what the GAO has warned about of this death spiral of increasing rates and then plunging volume? Yes, it would. Each of our product is subject to marketplace elasticities. And the higher we raise rates, the less mail we have. People have alternatives for every one of the products that we have. I want to turn now to one of the specific recommendations of the Commission. I believe that the Postal Service has something in the neighborhood of $7.2 billion in liabilities for workers' compensation. Is that in the neighborhood? Yes, it is. The, it, right now, as a result of reforms that were passed in the 1970s, it's my understanding that a postal employee who is receiving workers' compensation can remain on workers' compensation, assuming no return to work, forever, that there's not a conversion to retirement at a certain age. And in fact, I read one study that indicated the Postal Service was paying workers' comp benefits to an employee who was age 102. That's correct. Are you supporting the changes that the Commission recommended to have a conversion at some 
reasonable retirement age. I mean, obviously, our hope would be that we could get all, any injured worker uh, back to work and that we can avoid injuries in the first place. But for those workers who do receive workers' comp, do you support, first of all, the conversion at a normal retirement age, and second, the reinstatement of the three-day waiting period? On, on both counts, we do. We feel that it's, it's reasonable that at some point in time, and I'm not going to tell you what the age is. In fact, right now, we'd make money if it was 80 years old. Uh, at some point in time, people should be forced to uh, retire. Uh, it's unreasonable to pay uh, those escalating costs. We estimate that uh, on an annual basis, it costs us about $9,500 per employee who stays in on workers' comp rolls versus them uh, converting to a, a retirement pay at, at some reasonable point. So that's a big cost uh, to us. In addition, the three-day waiting period was converted in the past, and as a result, we saw a rise in claims. Uh, if I could, the Postal Service is working very hard on workers' comp area, and we believe that it starts with injuries and illnesses of our employees, and we've, we've gone very aggressively on a safety campaign to make sure that our employees don't get harmed. Our injury illness rate over the last three years is down 28 uh, percent. And despite that, our workers' compensation costs have grown. We're also working hard to find other employment. If people can't work in the Postal Service, find other employment for those people on workers' comp rolls. And today we have over 200 folks who don't work for the Postal Service but are on our workers' comp program work for private sector employers, and we make up the difference between what the private sector employer pays them and what they would get on workers' comp. So we are very interested in this area, and I think that the Treasury and the President's Commission was right to point it out as an opportunity, and we're working hard to fix it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Senator Carper. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. S since the um, tragedy of 9-11 and the anthrax attack, uh, something good has actually come out of something awful. And that something good is uh, improved performance within the uh, the postal service. And I think the uh, what's the old saying? Uh, success has many fathers, failures an orphan. Uh, in this case, uh, success has many fathers and, and mothers. Uh, I might add, and maybe one or two of the fathers are sitting at this table before us, and some are represented here in the the uh, the, uh, the audience in this hearing room. Uh, we've seen. Uh, remarkably improved uh, relations, working relations between. Uh, our labor unions, which represent uh, postal employees, the board, the board of governors, and, and postal management, and I would uh, would ask you: and this is not it's this, the fruits of those uh, labors, or the fruits of those improved relations, aren't something that we mandated. You know, we didn't pass a law that said you've got to do this, but you've done it. And, uh, and I, just take a moment and just talk about some of the positive steps that have been taken to provide maybe better service and at a more reasonable cost. This was for the general and also for, uh, for, for Mr. Feynman, Governor uh, Feynman, Governor. I, I'm, I'm very proud of the improved labor relations that we have in the Postal Service. And I think one of the keys to that is that we are focused on the customer. And we've put the customer first. And we as an organization have, have put that as our number one priority. Service is number one. And we do things as you know, efficiently as we possibly can. When, I, when you talk about the success of the Postal Service, and you talked about the mothers and fathers of it over the last several years. I think there are over 700,000 mothers and fathers of the success. It's each and every employee who comes to work every day dedicated to serving their customers and who have focused. Again, we're in tough times. People recognize that we have to change. And we engaged long before the President's Commission. We were engaged in the business of trying to improve service to our customers because we recognize we're in a competitive environment looking at opportunities that we had based on the changing mail mix and changing demographics to improve the efficiency of the mail that we ha of of the moving the mail throughout our system and i think it's just been an, a, an entire organization working together to make that happen we've seen improvements in in uh, in our relationship with the unions and i think that if there's a key to success is that we communicate and we've stressed the need to communicate up and down our organization on everything, and we are striving to treat each and every individual in our workforce as we'd want to be treated ourselves. Yeah. And it's not to say that it's a perfect system. 
with over 700,000 people. It can't be perfect, but we are working hard to try and achieve that. Yeah. Governor Feynman, before, before you uh, respond, let me just yeah, say, you, I, I would the general, before, you, before you speak, um, General Potter mentioned communicate, uh, better communications, and that uh, solves a lot of problems in, in, many, uh, in many forums. Um, we have had recommendations from the Commission that uh, on the issue of uh, collective bargaining that, uh, that, that we mandate through law that you uh, collective, collectively bargain uh, benefits, not just wages, but uh, benefits as well. And uh, I mean, there's probably some on, uh, in the House, some in the Senate who are inclined to do that, some maybe that are, that are reluctant. Um, and I would, uh, would ask for you to, maybe both, be thinking about whether there might be an opportunity as you communicate and have this dialogue between management, governors, and, and, and organized labor, uh, maybe the opportunity to, to dialogue on the issue of, uh, of uh, rather than mandate, if I was mandating uh, benefits, the, the collective bargaining I mean, maybe you just voluntarily try that, and uh, particularly before we uh, step in and, and, and legislate something. Let me just turn I, it over to I would Governor. just, if I could, yeah, please. let me just tell you that dialogue is taking place and will continue. Great. I would is there anything that we can do to, to sort of right. push well, that I, forward? I would just say that um, I congratulate management uh, when I came on to the board, um, there was not the same tone that was set between management and labor. When, when did you come on to the board? I government? came on at 1995 or okay. so. Um, there was not the same tone. There was this big backlog of, uh, of grievances. And, and slowly, and I think through previous Postmaster General, particularly <coughs> and Postmaster General Potter, there is a different tone that is set. The, the tone is set that we, we understand that at certain times we're going to be adversarial, but at the same time we have to keep talking to each other. Um, in regard to your second question, um, I have said publicly before and in my written statement that I've submitted that um, I'm a long believer in the collective bargaining system, and I would believe that I would hope that this committee in drafting legislation will not in any way uh, usurp that collective bargaining system through some uh, other kind of system, some of which is recommended by the Presidential Commission. I think it has to stay. Be and the reason the collective bargaining works and the reason it's working today is exactly what you said, Senator. It's a question to have open communication with people, to talk about what your problems are. And if you can have a collective bargaining system in which you set, w set wages, you're going to be talking to each other. You set up a process to keep talking with each other. We'll keep talking. Thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to d editorialize a bit, uh, Postmaster General, uh, General Potter mentioned the uh, testimony of UPS with respect to the question of cross-subsidies. Uh, it's a very hotly contested issue, one of the very first I heard about some nine years ago. And it, it, we have tried to come to the resolution, I know that the Postmaster General and others know this, but just for the record, come to a resolution that while the debate is interesting and important, it probably can't be decided given today's data realities. So what we have done in our bill, as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Collins, is to try to create a circumstance where the issue cannot happen in the future if, if it has happened in the past. And we all heard the uh, Postmaster General's strong denials, which I, which I respect. And we do that by creating a regulatory body, now the Postal Rate Commission, that uh, is uh, given all of the authority it would need to have to make those determinations unquestionably, subpoena power on data, powers it does not now have. So it, it, it certainly, uh, we've suggested to UPS for whatever faults they may have in the bill, that's something that they should be very, very supportive of. Uh, I also want to uh, associate myself with the comments of just about everyone who has spoken so far with respect to the frustration uh, regarding the uh, the escrow. Uh, Senator Collins uh, knows far better than anyone, as she noted, that it, the interesting dilemma here is that the administration's original bill actually would be more costly to the budget than, uh, than the 
ultimate uh, resolution, and, and it certainly, and this is no fault of the Treasury Department, I think it dramatically underscores the folly of, of budget scoring as it currently is constructed. And to suggest, and again, this isn't Treasury's fault, that's the way the game is played right now, to suggest that a $3 billion hit on the Treasury is better than a 6% increase in postal rates, the overall economy and budget situation of, of, of the United States of America is lunacy. And I'm just curious, again, that, that is no responsibility of yours, uh, Mr. Secretary, Secretary Roseboro. But I'm wondering, did, did the Treasury ever have a chance to determine what the overall impact to the economy of the United States would be, or ultimately, ultimately to the Treasury, if, if we had to do a 6 percent increase, 2 cent increase on first class? Uh, no specific analysis was done on that, sir. Uh, but, but, but again, uh, I think we can generalize and say it would not be good. Um, yep in terms of the economy, uh, without question. Uh, but secondly, again, I emphasize that we, th we think that it is not a, purely a binary decision of raise rates or take this course. Uh, we think there are some other options that could be explored, and uh, we eagerly look well, forward to working. I fully understand that. And again, uh, you're playing by the rules that were handed to you. That's not a direct criticism. Let, let's get to something that may be. You have mentioned, and, and Secretary Snow mentioned, uh, the allocation of costs to overhead, 42 percent. Although it's not said directly in the Secretary's testimony, and although you didn't say it directly, I'm certainly getting the impression that somehow you feel that that's wrong, that it ought to be higher. And you may or may not be right. Maybe it should be 50, maybe it should be 55. But I'm just curious, has the Treasury taken a position that 42 percent is by definition too low? And if so, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, no, sir, just the opposite. Okay. We feel 42 percent is too high. Uh, we think from a business perspective, uh, unallocated costs definitely should run south of 10 percent as a generality. Well, uh, obviously uh, it would you're, be you're right. I misspoke. Yeah. I spoke the other yeah. way around. But the, the, the unallocated costs mm -hmm. are, are too high. Y yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. How, how given, I, I, I could understand how, and, and Secretary Snow is certainly a very astute businessman, you could do that on the private sector, but how do you, how do you make that determination of the Postal Service? Is there a study been done or some kind of uh, uh, data? Again, from, from a, a business perspective, there is no comparison uh, for a commercial enterprise not being able to alloc allocate a higher percentage of its costs along products line, uh, and we think that that number could be improved uh, as the Postal Service works to improve systems, uh, whether technically on the MIS side, uh, to overall organization. But, but, but I don't mean to interrupt but, you, but my yeah. time is running out. But yeah. uh, there, there's no study, and by the way, the Postal Service, I think you agree, hardly fits the traditional business model. Uh, it's a totally different organization, but, but uh, be that as it may, you, you, you feel is, and, and I'm interested how you yeah. feel. I'm no, not no, compassionate we think, we to your feelings, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary, but that doesn't yes. mean that it's right or wrong. You, what, what I think, and let me ask my final question, if I may indulge the forbearance of the chairman and the other distinguished members. Would I be correct in saying, and I would fully support this if, I, if, if, if it is your view, that the Treasury position is we need to more finely hone the allocation of those costs to ensure that it is distributed accurately. Would that be a fair statement? Yes, sir. Without yes, sir. prejudging what it ought to be? Yes, yes sir. Based Thank on you. the principle of self-financing, if there's going to be adequate self-financing, if that is going to be successful, uh, it goes without saying that proper cost allocation uh, is key to setting appropriate rates. And thank a big you. part of that. I thank you very much, Secretary. I fully agree with that. I, I'm glad we were able to clear it up. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you uh, very much, Ms. Norton. There's a kind of fictional quality to this hearing, if I may say so. Um, for example, on the veterans' benefits, weren't many of those benefits uh, accrued before there was any postal service as we know it? Uh, you know. Uh, uh, Mr. Roseborough, the, the, the notion of holding the Postal Service accountable with the, the administration, not holding itself accountable, is very interesting to me. So you're offloading veterans' benefits, which of course no private corporation would have to pay, but even veterans' benefits predating 
the 1970 formation of the Postal Service. And you think that's a fair way to go with postal reform? Uh, uh, yes, Congresswoman. Uh, again, in the context of the postal legislation that was passed last year, and again, it's very important to look at this as the package and in what the package attempted to do. Uh, one, it attempted to make the SERS pension funding in the postal uh, equivalent, if you will, to the FERS system, which requires this. Uh, additionally, again, I will emphasize the dynamic analysis given to the Postal Service uh, has never been done before and, again, resulted in even with the $27 billion obligation to the Postal Service on the military funding, uh, still leaving $21 billion for the Treasury taxpayer, uh, a net plus $78 billion. Uh, that's not done either in the private sector. Um, so we think in terms of a package, uh, it was more than fair and reflect it uh, in the legislation that was passed as a package and we think in terms of postal reform and moving forward to go back and undo that particular cherry-picked aspect of it uh, is a step backwards in postal reform. Yeah, just like you think the escrow is, we, 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 you know, we uh, in other words, uh, accountability all works uh, uh, against the post office and in your favor. Uh, let, let, let me uh, let, I served on, before I came to Congress, I served on the board of three Fortune 500 companies. So when I look at your, your list of, of recommendations, uh, they read like the list that any corporation would have, not any corporation you know, about to, that would be in bankruptcy or be out of business uh, if it were in the private sector. For example, and, 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 and this is the kind of criticism I have and why I, I can't accept the administration's uh, 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 recommendations with a straight face. I could if you said, for example, in implementing best practices, ensure that the Postal Service's governing body is equipped to meet the responsibilities and objectives of a private enterprise, I take it you mean. Uh, of course, that's left out. Uh, of its size and scope, and it seems to me you should add right there under best practices of its prize and scope with the obligation to give universal service. Instead, you put universal service under accountability because you're going to make sure that the Postal Service under the accountability se uh, section uh, has the appropriate oversight to protect consumer welfare and universal mail service. I just think, you know, you, 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 you need to sit down with some people in the private sector uh, to figure out how to set your own goals in, in a more realistic way. And I think you will find, uh, Mr. Rosebar over here, that whatever was said last year or even this year, members here in, in the final context tend to regard Ratepayers and taxpayers is interchangeable, uh, and I, I have a hard time believing uh, that some of what uh, uh, proposes here uh, will pass the laugh test here in the Congress if it gets to the floor. Um, you, the, 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 uh, for example, just let me a to, to, to ask a question about uh, some of the double speak. Uh, that I find in, this, uh, in these recommendations. On top of everything else, about the last thing the Postal Service needs is a complete blow up or explosion uh, of its labor relations. They're already bad enough. Um, you apparently support collective bargaining, but would establish a three member board appointed by the President to set compensation. Well, the last time I heard wages were considered by most employees a central feature to compensation. Uh, are, you are you saying that the Postal Service should have uh, a collective bargaining regimen like that of federal workers whom we do not pretend are a part of the private sector? Uh, actually, uh, in referring to the 35 uh, recommendations uh, from the Commission, 
Uh, as we indicated in the beginning, uh, while we think the commission did a great, admirable job in laying out some prescriptions for reform, uh, we did not support all the recommendations. Do you support that recommendation? We, so, we, we support collective bargaining. We do not support a board to uh, determine uh, comparable do you explore compensation. you continuing bargaining for wages as you do, as the Postal Service does today? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ms. Norton. Mr. Clay. Followed Thank by you, Ms. Mr. Malone. Chairman, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Potter, uh, let me ask you about the uh, the Postal Service requested $350 million for emergency preparedness uh, for fiscal year 2004, uh, which it did not receive, and $779 million for fiscal year 2005. Uh, I understand the money would help you, the uh, Postal Service, buy and install systems to de detect biological agents and poisons and new ventilation and filtration systems in 282 mail handling centers nationwide. If money is not appropriated for emergency preparedness, will funding for this pur uh, purpose have to be built into uh, postal rates? Yes, it will. Are there any other options other than postal rates? No. It's either an appropriation or a rate increase. So again, we get back to a tax increase, as the chairman stated. Okay, the President's Commission has recommended rescinding existing regulations that require citizen input uh, before closing plants and small post offices. A uh, rural and urban post offices deemed unprofitable would be closed, and future services would be provided on, a, on an ability to pay model. Uh, does this undermine the service's mission to provide service and access to all communities uh, at uniform rates? The issue of post offices is, is one that's very complex. Right now, as you said, there's, a, there's rules and, and a comment period. Certainly, we'd want to have the comment of communities as we, we look to change our infrastructure. We're not uh, proposing abandoning communities. Uh, we're proposing that we deliver services in a different way. For example, we have some post office in America where people actually have to come and pick up their mail. Mm -hmm. We might alternatively have those folks have their mail delivered closer to their door to a rural uh, mailbox. Mm -hmm. Those rural carriers are post offices on wheels. Uh, the issue of post offices is very complex. True. Uh, when I think of, of post offices and post office closings, there are people who are trying to intimate that we would close, you know, uh, 20,000 of our 38,000 outlets. That's not the case. But on, on the one end of the spectrum, we have over 2,500 post offices that have less than 200 people living in the area that they serve. And we have over 4,500 that have less than 200 deliveries. Now, I certainly think that any good organization should have the ability or the option of exploring how they could deliver services to those communities. But the post office that we all think about that, you know, serves populations of several thousand people, they're not going to close. We need those facilities to, to provide delivery services, post office box services, as well as counter services. And I don't envision those closing in, in, in my lifetime. But there are those issues out there where we should be able to explore how we could better economically serve communities. And you're absolutely right. It is about efficiency and streamlining the, the service, and I appreciate your answer. Uh, Mr. Roseboro, perhaps you can answer for uh, Secretary Snow, who stated uh, that the recalculation of postal retirement costs provided the Postal Service with a properly calculated enormous gain of $78 billion at the expense of other CSRS participants. We understood that the Postal Service was on track to overfund its obligations by $78 billion. Wouldn't that suggest that Postal Service was, in essence, supporting the rest of the CSR as participants uh, with its contributions? Uh, the Postal Service was the only CSRS participant that received the benefit of this dynamic analysis. So in that, in that sense, they benefited. Okay, well, well then, okay, this takes me to the next question. And how can correcting a considerable overpayment uh, be considered a gain for the Postal Service? I wouldn't characterize it, sir, as correcting an overpayment. 
uh, again, it was putting it on equal footing with the FERS, the Federal Employment Retirees System uh, pension uh, uh, setup. Uh, that was, uh, would be a more accurate characterization, and doing that uh, resulted in the $78 billion uh, dollar gain for the Postal Service, as well as the obligation to pay the $27 billion uh, portion of the military pension cost. Well, isn't it true that uh, the $27.9 billion that represents the military cost obligation that has been transferred from Treasury to the Postal Service? Uh, 17 billion of this amount is retroactive to 1971 and has already been paid to retirees? I understand that to be correct, yes. Yes. I think it's, yes. that's true, so, okay. Yes. And then when they set up FERS in 1983, was, wasn't it applied prospectively to individual new hires employed after 83? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. You're not sure about it. I believe it was. Mm -hmm. but I Maybe think you could get back you. to us on that yeah. and try to try to do it. Thank you very, thank thank you. very much. Ms. Thank Morning. you. I thank the chair, men and women of the respective bodies for holding this important hearing and, and I thank all of the panelists for all of your hard work in these difficult times and I am uh, very pleased that a New Yorker is at the helm of the Postal Department, Mr. Potter. We are all very proud of your hard work. I, I first of all would like to be associated with the comments of my colleague, uh, Mr. Clay, on on the need for the Federal Government to fund adequately the Post Office's uh, need for preparedness and, and homeland security concerns that have been piled on with the anthrax uh, threat. And also the, the comments of my colleague uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton that any reform not weaken collective bargaining or jeopardize the health benefits of our hardworking employees. I would like to ask a Mr. Potter, we now have a, a freeze on, uh, on uh, postal rates until 2006. And for the first time, according to GAO, the volume of postal uh, mail has dropped. And uh, some recommend that, that it may continue to drop. And my question is, do you believe that an extension of the current uh, rate freeze would benefit the U.S. Postal Service after 2006? I believe that uh, the longer we can hold rates stable, the more opportunity we have to grow volume. Well, as you know, in 2006, uh, we will be reviewing the escrow account and how it should be used. And uh, what reforms have you put in place to um, make services available so that the mail can get out at a reasonable rate that uh, benefits uh, all of our residents and all of our businesses. I, I, uh, in addition to representing actually the postal workers who were in the anthrax scare in New York City, I also represent many magazines and publishers. And in the past several years, several have gone out of business, Mademoiselle, Mode, Brill, uh, Business Weekly, a number of uh, very significant magazines. And the reason that they state that they went out of business was the increased cost of postal rate. Uh, this has the ramification of many workers losing their jobs at a time when uh, over three million private sector jobs have been lost in our economy uh, recently. This is very serious. So what steps are you taking to really run the post office more like a business so that our workers are employed with their benefits and that the businesses can afford to employ people, pay taxes, and, and contribute their, their, uh, their, their, their aspect to the American economy? First of all, we are working very hard to improve service. Uh, and we have done that in every measure category and non-measure categories. We see complaints down. Customer satisfaction nationally is at all-time highs. Our costs, we have taken $2.7 billion of costs out of our system in the last two years. When we put the transformation plan together, we said that we would achieve $5 billion in, uh, of cost savings out of our bottom line. That is above and beyond the, the savings that we have had as a result of uh, reduction in volume. So we are very focused on becoming more efficient. Now, unfortunately, that has meant that we have had fewer employees. So if you talk about unemployment, 
since I've been Postmaster General, it's less than three years, we've reduced our career workforce by almost 70,000 people. And I'm not proud of that, proud of the productivity improvement, but I wish we had volume so that uh, we could keep every, everyone gainfully employed. Now, we've done that through attrition and we've worked with our our unions and our management associations on that, but we are very, very focused on improving service, reducing costs. You speak of periodical mailers. We have, uh, in the last three years, introduced automated flat sorters to handle periodical mails, and we have seen our productivity of what we call flat mail, or oversized letters, catalogs, uh, uh, periodicals, magazines. We have seen our productivity double. Uh, so. We are very much concentrated and working closely with those folks in the periodical industry to improve our productivity and to do the best we can to flatten their rates out. Well, how can the post office uh, better adopt to the technological advances that have contributed to the, to the decline in first class mail? Well, the, the best way we can do it is by employ them. And we have the most automated postal system in the world. Uh, that has helped enable us to, to reduce our workforce and improve our productivity. Uh, we are also reaching out to customers over the web. We recognize that that's a place where people are doing business and we're working very hard to reach people where they are. We believe that uh, we need to bring our services to the door of every American. After all, we're there every day and we want to bring our services to them at their door, whether it's stamps by mail or, or other issues, and uh, uh, we're focused on growth, and uh, we believe a combination of high levels of service, improved productivity, and uh, a focus on growing the business and being customer friendly are the, the, the ingredients that will help us be successful going forward. Thank you. For thank, uh, thank you. Time's up. General Lady's time's expired. Okay. Thank you very much. If you, if you want to do any follow-ups, I'm sure if you'd submit them to the panel, we have to. I uh, have one more uh, member. Uh, Mr. Duncan has joined us. Uh, I can recognize him for five minutes. But before I do, I want to insert in the record a, a letter from Grover Norquist, Americans for Tax Reform, uh, to uh, John McHugh. And it notes at the end, it says, as Congress prepares to address uh, postal reform this year, it seems pension reform might be a good place to start. I urge you to support transferring the military service pension obligation from the USPS back to the Treasury and to allow the USPS to stop overfunding the civil service retirement system. Without objection, this will be placed in the record. Gentleman from Tennessee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I was here for a few minutes earlier, but then had to leave because of some appointments, and I apologize. But uh, I'm. I read uh, uh, this article, that, uh, an article that ran a few months ago in the New York Daily News about the uh, Office of the Inspector General of the Postal Service um, holding um, conferences where uh, at, at one conference in 2001 some staffers, uh, staffers wrapped each other from head to toe in toilet paper, aluminum foil straws and pipe cleaners. At an annual conference in Washington in December of 2003, 725 employees went on a treasure hunt to seek clues from costumed actors playing a wizard, magician, dragon, princess, and mad scientist. Uh, at another annual conference um, in 2002, uh, employees built tents out of newspapers, hopscotched across a ballroom on squares, um, learned scat singing, uh, all, all these ridiculous things. And they spent millions of dollars doing this. I, I could, uh, one of the conferences was 1.2 million, one was 1.3 million, uh, one was 1.1 million. And I, I'm assuming that, th that this type of thing has been cut out or eliminated. But I would like for you to assure me on the record that it has been eliminated and that uh, we're not having conferences of top management at the Postal Service that are going in for these uh, really, they, they talk about conferences where people, where the employees were asked to hiss like snakes, quack like ducks. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, and, we, and, we, and they spent millions of dollars doing these things. Congressman, um, I want to assure you that that is not occurring any longer. I want to assure you that uh, when the Board of Governors received uh, complaints about things of this sort, and those articles particularly, we took what were appropriate steps, uh, referred those complaints to the President's Council on uh, 
efficiency, PCIE, um, who did their own investigation, separate investigation uh, on these matters. Uh, we were working very closely on the Senate side with Senator Grassley, who had an interest in these matters. Uh, the Inspector General, uh, who was then in charge of these matters, has since resigned, and a new Inspector General has been hired, uh, someone who comes with vast experience in the area, and I can assure you that that office is being revamped and uh, is now acting in an efficient and appropriate fashion. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And let me, again, Senator Collins, thank you very much for co-hosting this with me and Mr. Davis and other members for being present uh, for this uh, today. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for taking the time from their busy schedules to appear before us. The committee stands adjourned. Mm, let me catch up. Sunday on Road to the White House. The Dick Cavett Show! This is John O'Neill. This is John Kerry. 27-year-old Vietnam veteran John Kerry uh, defends his views on Vietnam. He was a guest in 1971 uh, on the Dick Cavett Show, debating fellow Navy veterans.